How did a husband and wife break and establish four world records yeah. in one weekend of boating? Let's go. We just gotta go hard. Uh, I go the hardest. I break the pain. Stay tuned for this true story, Epic Adventure. It's all part of the game. Yeah, I just gotta go hard. What's it like to go from Maine to Key West by boat in one weekend? And what's it like to have breakfast in New York City, boat all the way down the East Coast to have dinner in Florida all in one day? Is it even possible? And if it is, what were the challenges and what were the pitfalls? What were the high points and what were the low points? And were our lives actually endangered? In order to pull this off, we were gonna need a really fast boat, not a yacht something that was going to be smaller, an open cockpit with limited electronics. And with limited creature comforts, we knew it was going to be extremely difficult, both mentally and physically, to take that boat that far offshore, that fast, and for days on end. So the gauntlet was laid down. Did Sarah and I have the mental and physical fortitude to endure this offshore pounding without food or sleep for days? How did it affect our relationship? Did it bring us further apart? We're closer together. Nothing could have prepared us for what we were about to experience. But isn't that what a true adventure is about? It's about the unknowing. It's about the anticipation. And it's about finally conquering something that's on the edges of your capability. So I'd like to invite everybody along, not just boaters. People that are looking for a true story. Where we go from Maine to Key West by boat in one weekend. Where we test the limits of this boat, its engines, our physical and mental ability, and our relationship. And where we might just capture some world records in the meantime. Obviously everybody can watch this how they want to watch it. But my recommendation is to wait, to pause. Wait till you're at home, sitting on your couch with your loved ones. And have a little bit of time to truly enjoy a once in a lifetime adventure and truly unique content you'll find only on how to live. So how did an adventure this crazy, how did it start? And the answer is simple, it started with a dream. What would it be like to have breakfast in New York City and dinner in Miami all on the same day by boat? It had never been done before and just for that reason, we were going to try it. We had a perfect boat for the attempt, but it was going to need some modifications and I think that's where this story is going to start. What do we have to do to end up in the Hudson River next to the Lady Liberty at 3 a.m. in the morning, ready to go on this epic adventure? But first, I think it's time for a little bit of history. The record for New York City to Miami, or Miami to New York City, has actually been a thing since 1921. In 1962, motorboating and sailing magazine turned it into an actual record, and they called it the Chapman Trophy. The record had been broken several times up until 1988, when a very famous boating racer, Tom Gentry, broke the record with his 112-foot, 11,460 horsepower, extreme super yacht titled the Gentry Eagle. The 19 hours and 17 minutes stands today as the open class boating record. Now, because not all boats are created equal, there is a 1984 record that still stands, and that is the outboard boat record by Julio de Verona. Now, both of these records are officially recognized by Ocean Cup World Speed Records, UIM, and American Powerboat Association records. Because this trek was almost 2,000 miles, it was so long, there are some other records we could break by just passing through the waypoints. And one of them was a New York City to Hatteras record held by Fountain Powerboats and established in 2008. 
Cape Hatteras, North Carolina to New York City in six hours, 10 minutes and eight seconds. I think it's pretty important to note that in our extensive research, we did not find any established world records from Portland, Maine to Key West and from Portland, Maine to New York City. Sarah and I were hopeful maybe we could establish those as how to live records. And honestly, to me, the coolest record is from Portland, Maine to Key West. I mean, that's essentially the entire East Coast of the United States. Did we have what it takes to boat that in less than a weekend? And sometimes it's hard to even comprehend how long the East Coast actually is, whether that be by plane, trains, automobiles, or by boat. Now, Sarah and I decided not to officially sanction our run by outside entities. And the main reason was we just wanted to challenge ourselves. And we were out for a weekend trip from Maine to Key West by boat. Whatever happens, happens. But what we did not want was the added pressure and costs of having a sanctioned event. However, we did thoroughly document our run with dual GPS devices, pictures, live feed video, and timestamp GPS waypoints. And we did all that just in case we made it. And now with more GPS data and proof than most runs, certainly in 1988, we can post the proof publicly on our website shared on Facebook and call this the new How to Live record. I'm going to timestamp this photo right now. Oh, we just broke the world record from New York to Hatteras, huh? You and me. <laughs> and the last thing I'd like to mention with the background for this run is something we observed through our research. While Sarah and I have the advantage of better technology than these other record holders, we didn't have a big team and massive support. We didn't have helicopters and airplanes and fueling barges and other boats. It was just us and a couple people on shore. And that, to me, means more than any of the record times. I think that wraps it up for the background. Everyone's caught up to speed. Yeah, pun intended. Time for the prep. Now we had purchased hull number one of the MTI 440, and although it's a fantastic boat, it wasn't ready for this adventure out of the hull. It was simply gonna need night vision, new motors, new gas tanks, and a whole lot of other stuff we're gonna get to. And if you're gonna boat the entire East Coast, one of the first things you're gonna need is a ground support tow rig. And enter stage left of 2024 GMC 3500 HD Denali Ultimate. With fuel 20s, a 6 inch lift, 35 inch tires, and a little bit of a light show. The good old jacked up single track truck. Now well, it's a little old school, guys. Today, it's all about the fat donkey. But we have a ton of work to do, a ton of manual labor, and, uh, it's going to be a hard job, but we're not going to do it messing around. It's certainly not time to take a break. And I just, I just don't know if we have the manpower to do it. Honey, let's get that fuel tank in. Where did you put that thing? So the first major upgrade for the 2023 MTI 440X is going to be replacing the 450s. Now, the 450s are a fantastic motor and very well proven, but the Mercury 500s are a brand new engine with upgraded lower units which is a much better choice for a long endurance run like this where you're bound to hit debris in the water. The first thing we were going to have to do is level the boat and trailer and trim the motors perfectly level. We needed to assess exactly where the 450s were mounted within a sixteenth of an inch. This is critical information to have when mounting the 500s. So come rain or shine, doesn't really matter, we're getting those numbers. Alright, with the 450s off, the next step is to mount the 500s, which would typically happen at our DSK manufacturing facility in Connecticut. However, Sarah and I plan to start this whole adventure from our house, from our actual dock in Maine. So to avoid trailering and for the ease of logistics, we decided to mount the 500s in my driveway. One rented forklift, a wife, a couple of friends, and a few hours later, they were on. It certainly helped that the mounting bracketry for the 500 is the exact same as the 450 and I would not have done it this way otherwise. Let's not forget, before we put the motors on, Sarah's gonna help out tightening these brackets up to make sure they're good for the endurance run. It's almost impossible for me to fit in there, so it's Sarah's job now, and I think she likes it. And it certainly beats a slow motion shot of me coming out of the Sponson hatch. All tight, garbage 
time. All right, next modification. Now, due to the length of the East Coast and the fact that there's only about 16 to 17 hours of daylight in the summertime, we knew we were going to have to run at night. And usually running at night for most boats isn't a very big deal. They're slow and they're usually big enough to house all the night vision equipment and radar. We knew we were going to have to be going about 70 to 80 miles an hour at night in the pitch dark. And that there, that's a problem and it's dangerous. So we ended up settling on two different night vision capabilities. The first is low light and the second is thermal. And we learned very quickly that each had their upsides and downsides. And I think it's time for a little disclaimer here. How to Live has not been sponsored by FLIR or by Black Oak. It also hasn't been sponsored by MTI or Mercury Racing for that matter. How to Live is its own entity and we keep it that way so we can be honest with you and give you guys an honest review. I'm excited to see how the 440's new NVGs do. Yeah, so this is the, I don't know why we're whispering. I feel like at night you just have to whisper. And this is the Black Oak Nitron XD. It's on the front of the boat, way up there. But that's what we got. So honey, I want you to run across the screen like we're moving 100 miles an hour, okay? <laughs> oh no. Oh, there she is. Now, I can see her microphone LED light lighting up big time, but I can see her very easily. And in real life, I can't see anything out there. I can't, she's gonna do some push-ups. She's doing burpees. My wife is in shape, I will say that. So that might be one win for the low light camera. However, there's one thing you have to consider, and that is movement. Notice how the camera is very still. One question remains, how is this going to work at 70 to 80 miles an hour? There's only one way to find out. What we're doing here is we waited for sunset, now it's dark out. And we're going to go try out our new night ops. And Sarah's so excited, she's had a full week of work. <laughs> I just want to watch a movie. You want to what? I just want to watch a movie. <laughs> she's just saying that. <laughs> She's just saying that she doesn't really just want to watch a movie and cuddle up on this Friday evening after a full week of work. She wants to go on the boat right now and check out the night vision operation I get going and spent all day on. Oh, there she is. This is the 440. <laughs> this is main water, man. This is cold water. It's deep, but it's unforgiving. If you go overboard up here, you die pretty quickly. Um, you get hypothermia very quickly, and it's the shoreline's very unforgiving. It's all granite rocks. You have to know what you're doing. So we're gonna take this seriously, and um, we're gonna, you know, hook up our night vision and see how it comes out. Right now, it's actually darker to the naked eye than it is in this phone. Kind of amazing, actually. It's definitely not that bright out right now. First things first, we're gonna set up the black oak. We're gonna, because I already pre-wired these cameras. With the sea suckers, which are sea suckers, awesome. Set up yeah. now. Some of you guys might be like, Why don't you just get like hard mount, you know, night vision cameras on this? The problem is, where are you going to put them? You know, this is a, this is a very um, sleek speedboat. They do have pop ups up front that we didn't ha we didn't like because they weren't high enough. So, this is a portable system, suction cups right to the windshield. You can take it off when you're done using it in the daytime and just store it. So I already set this up today for night ops. We hit night ops, boom, watch this. Boom, and boom. Here we go. I haven't seen that yet. So now we have, what we have here is we have FLIR. This is thermal and then we have our low light. Look at the same pictures. And the black wolf? So this is a lobster and trap then, yeah. and this is a lobster yeah, trap. That's cool. Now are you excited to come out here? Kinda, you just try it? Kind of woke up a little bit. So there's a can. There's a good example of why you should have both of these. That's a can and so is that. So this is where the FLIR actually, I think, does better than 
the low light and here's why the low light is giving us a bunch of these reflections from the water and there's a buoy right there i, I it was hidden in the light so I hope this shows that both cameras are actually needed for the type of speeds that we're going to be doing. While the low light is really good at picking up details at slower speeds and in low light, it's not great at picking up detail at higher speeds in really low light while offshore. And this is where Flare's thermal camera really excels. In fact, when we did the run, as you guys will see, we primarily used the thermal camera between 70 and 80 miles an hour, and we felt relatively, well, safe when we did or should I say safe-ish. But I would like to throw another disclaimer out here. This is how Sarah and I decided to run our boat well offshore at night for our own record attempt purposes. We do not run these speeds at night recreationally, nor do we recommend it. While there were many risky parts of this voyage, running at night at this speed offshore was certainly our most dangerous. Do not try this at home. Now we chose not to run a radar on this operation due to, well, fitment issues on this boat. But if I had to do it over again, I would figure out a way to include radar somehow in these night operations. Even if we stuck it on a semi-permanent pole in the back. It would certainly help out in these night operations, but it would also really help out in the fog that we experienced, you'll see coming up. All right, now it's time for the last big modification, and that is to add auxiliary fuel tanks. Now there is one big issue. This is a brand new boat and I did not want to permanently modify it in any way for this attempt. This was my only hard rule. I didn't mind removing seats or other parts of the boat. I wanted it to return to stock and be a perfect boat after this attempt. It also says a lot for the boat itself to only need auxiliary fuel tanks and not be modified in any way to make a trip this long. Okay, so it's time to remove some seats. Now that might be a little harder than you think in a boat like this. So it's time for my perfectly sized wifey to activate once again. Sorry, honey, I just don't fit. Why are you dressed like that? <laughs> I'm not sure you told me to bring home a suit. <laughs> After a tricky removal of the seats and a new well-earned nickname for my wife, Sponson Monkey, it was time to install the gas tanks. Were they gonna fit and was this even gonna work? Again, another reason I didn't want to permanently do any modifications to this boat. I needed to know it was going to go exactly back to stock at any point. The stock MTI 440X comes with dual 75 gallon fuel tanks that are independent and housed in each sponson. Reducing the amount of fuel stops in this attempt to get down the east coast as fast as possible is going to be critical. In fact, the current world record holder for the open class at 19 hours, the Gentry, didn't have to refuel. It had enough fuel to go from Miami to New York in one shot so they were able to save a lot of time. After extensive efficiency testing, we knew that we could make this trip with only two fuel stops, as long as we added about 125 more gallons on board. I had sized these fuel tanks specifically for this boat to make sure they fit snug within the cockpit and actually had the walls and the rear seat as physical limitations for moving around. To secure the tanks even further, I used high-density polymer wedges and 3M VHB. This would increase the coefficient of friction between the bottom of the fuel tanks and the sea deck, further locking them in. Lastly, I utilized 3,000-pound ratchet straps for each tank that were attached to 3-8 stainless steel eye loops that were then bolted to the existing OEM 3-8 holes for the seats. Now, I did deliberate whether or not I should use bigger straps, but here's the problem. You're as good as your weakest point and I actually wanted that weakest point to be the straps. I did not want the weakest point to be where it bolted to the hull. If you rip that out offshore, there's no way to repair it, and you're gonna have a permanently loose tank on deck until you can limp to shore and repair the hull. But if you break a strap offshore, you can just replace it and keep moving without damaging the hull or the boat. Furthermore, these tanks were gonna be heaviest and filled with fuel for a very short period of time, and that's only when we were leaving refueling stations and navigating inshore waters. Lightly, just lightly go ahead and brush that on. And again, we're just gonna, we're gonna feel it. We're gonna, we're gonna let the prop become part of the environment. Let that prop just stand out from the background. Let the landscape become part of the landscape. Just pull it out of the canvas. Oh my God, look at that. Ooh, that's not good.
Honey, I'm done with your um, nail uh, sander block um, thingamabobby. Well, Bobby. You can keep it. I don't want that back. Looks fine to me. Hear that? You can actually hear the polish. With every modification, we did end up testing the boat. Putting the new 500s on was a pretty big deal. First, this is the maiden voyage for the 500s. This is gonna be awesome, I hope. Now it's time to just start them up for the first time in the water. I believe they're ready. Port motor first, full ignite. Let's do starboard. If you guys have been watching the channel, you know that, well, I get excited pretty easily. Pretty sure this is no exception. I mean, this is so exciting. Here we are, it's, it is foggy today, and we have a lot of thunderstorms rolling in, but we are taking the 500s out for the first time. Just gonna touch them off a little bit. We're gonna break them in a little bit. We're not gonna get rambunctious with them and overspeed them, okay? We're just gonna settle down. Subcap, we're not just gonna hit the throttle. We're gonna ease into it. The first thing I notice immediately is the is the slight vibration from the engine idle speed. And that is because they actually put stiffer durometer rubber into the motor mounts because the motor mounts, um, you know, uh, take a lot of abuse. So they stiffen them up to make them a little bit more durable, but a little bit less comfortable when it comes to having a little bit of motor vibration. I, I felt it immediately. For me, I'd rather have a motor mount work great and be more durable. So that's the first thing I feel. She carries that front end so much better. Oh! It's like a mac, it's like a homemade four cheese macaroni and cheese with bacon. <laughs> and hot dogs after a full day of skiing in the slopes and you're just hungry. That's what that was like. Well, I know I was a little hyper there, but you guys, that's how I felt. The 500 is the real deal. It has a ton of different advantages over any other motor that I've ever driven. But this isn't a review on the 500. That's going to come later in another episode. This is about prepping this boat for this epic adventure. And so far, it looks like the Mercury Racing 500s are going to be perfect for the 440 and this endurance run. Well, with the boat prepped and passing all of its tests, it was time. It was time to wait for Mother Nature to open up a window. And while it was unlikely we'd have great weather along the whole East Coast at any one given time, we had to give it a shot at some point. And that, you guys, is going to be for next episode. You guys know the channel rules. We only roll for about 20 to 30 minutes. Lunch and dinner's over. It's time to get back to work. This episode was the prep. The next one will be the actual attempt. So stay tuned, you guys, for crazy content of when a husband and wife leave Maine to go to Key West by boat and pull it off in a weekend. We hope to see you guys on the water. Until next time, boat safe, boat happy, over and out.